Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the sixth and final part of our Selling MDM to Leadership uh, series. Objective here uh, is not been to talk about anything technical, really, with regard to master data management, more about uh, you know how do you get your initiative started um, and how do you drive it to a successful completion. So um, the first uh, session was just around, are you, are you and the organization really ready for this? Uh, the second one was about uh, defining the why or you know, why would we do this? How would you justify it and to get people um, you know, aligned behind the initiative? Uh, then some discussion around total cost of ownership, because that's obviously a big part of, of the return on investment. Um, the program scope, particularly figuring out how do you get early quick wins, because uh, that you know if you don't get that, then you may not get a chance to go any farther. Um, then evaluation pitfalls was yesterday. Hopefully we give a little bit of insight around um, what we see that is generally a good habit versus a bad habit when it comes to uh, evaluating software and kicking off a, a, an exercise. And then this last one, I kind of think of as, you know, the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Um, the, the first use case gets the, the, the spotlight shone on it because it uh, being the first one, that's where you're trying to make most of the justification. But really where the enormous value accrues from MDM is when you accomplish the first one and then move forward into the second, third, and fourth. And that's really what we're going to be talking about here today uh, because the, the subsequent use cases tend to be cheaper and faster. Uh, and they build a, um, a way of working, which is uh, very positive. And uh, we have a, a good number of customers that have done this and uh, is really gratifying whenever we see that because uh, it shows that they're really uh, starting to get a huge amount of value, even more value, I should say, uh, out of their investment. So that's great to hear. Um, I won't spend a lot of time introducing uh, the team here because We've been doing that every day, <laughs> and I expect, I think, a good number of people here have been on, on a lot of the calls. Uh, just real quick, uh, from the bottom, uh, my name is Martin Boyd. I'm the VP of Product Marketing here at Prophecy, and I'll be moderating and, and talking a little bit uh, as well in, uh, in, in this session. Uh, Harbert is our uh, heads up our value management consulting uh, team. Uh, he owns the BIR program, which is the Business Impact Roadmap program, which is where we help our customers uh, try and identify their ROI, uh, um, help give them guidelines around uh, you know, which um, use cases to tackle first versus second, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, something that we aim to do, we're happy to do with all of our customers. And as a practical matter, about half of our customers take us up on it uh, as part of their uh, um, uh, buying process, which we're, we're always happy to see because we do find there's a strong correlation between having done a BIR exercise and uh, you know, eventual success uh, in, in implementation. Uh, Christopher Dwight is our VP of Customer Success at Prophecy. Christopher has had a long, uh, continues to have a, a long career in uh, uh, DM from uh, uh, early days uh, through um, Oracle and Informatica. He's been uh, engaged in this space for, for quite some time, has a lot of experience helping customers understand what they need to do. Um, and Bill O'Kane, uh, former Gartner analyst, Bill uh, managed and owned the Gartner uh, quadrant, uh, magic quadrant for MDM for eight years and has spent a lot of time talking about MDM over the years. So um, I, I've mentioned this in a couple of the other calls. We're not here to sell anything uh, at this point. We're not here to sell prophecy, but we are all fairly um, passionate about master data management. So if there's anybody, uh, anything that gets discussed that you want to uh, follow up on, feel free to reach out to us if you're engaged on an MDM journey. We're, we're always happy to talk. So that is our intro. Um, and with that, let's uh, uh, get to the meat. So beyond the first use case, um, the key here, and I'm, I'm actually going to lead off a little bit on, on this segment because uh, um, it, it's something I've been working on just recently. Um, the first topic we want to talk about is master data management shouldn't be viewed as a project, it's a way of life. Uh, this this um, little phrase came from a customer that I, I reached out to just uh, recently, uh, and I asked him, um, you know, as, as a precursor to just having a checkup, how, how's the project going? Uh, and he said, oh, it's not a project anymore, now it's a way of life. And he said it a little bit tongue in cheek, but it, it really led to crystallizing the, the a way of crystallizing the thought that um, when you get to your second, third, and fourth use case, building on the Master Data Management Foundation, um, it really does become a way of operating. 
um, and we'll hear in various stories that we uh, um, put into the conversation today that uh, you, when you do get to the second, third and fourth use case, um, generally people in the organization start reaching out and saying, oh, I see what you did with this project or this area or this team. Can you do that for me as well? And uh, you start to build a little bit of uh, momentum around it, a little bit of uh, feeling of uh, a center of expertise and people in the organization management sees how well it's been going and say, you know, you should take on this project or you should, you, this team, you should go speak to our MDM team and, and figure out how you can work together. Um, it, it starts to develop a, a momentum and some, some people start to feel <laughs> overworked and overwhelmed, but those are high class problems to have, right? Because you're delivering <laughs> much value that people really want to, uh, 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 to get engaged. So I'm going to uh, just go through a couple of, of high-level examples that have really come from uh, other recent webinars we've done. If you've been following our webinars, you may recognize some of these, but uh, it doesn't make them bad examples. So um, this first one here uh, around uh, um, in healthcare. So we have a number of customers in, uh, in healthcare, and uh, most of them start with uh, building out a provider hub. So this, uh, and if you're not in healthcare, let me just explain really briefly what that means. Um, the provider hub, if if you're delivering healthcare services, you have doctors and nurses and uh, you know all kinds of uh, people like that who have credentials that need to be well understood. Um, you need to probably have a, a website that shows those people so that you that customers or customers, uh, I mean patients, uh, prospective patients can find them and schedule time with them. And it's a foundation for billing and all kinds of other things like that. So if you don't have a good provider hub in place, then your, your life is going to be chaotic and uh, uh, very reactive. Um, and if you do have a good provider hub in place that has a list of all these people, it has a list of all their credentials, their, uh, um, their uh, you know, what locations do they work out of, all of that kind of stuff, then it enables immediately a whole bunch of use cases. Um, I'm not talking here about how you go build a build the hub, but if you've got that, you know, various pieces of information from the from the business come together to build our, our hub. The very first thing you would probably do is publish that as part of your web directory, um, and the the Cures Act mandates that you also publish it as an API so that other people can access that data. That might be the most basic thing you do, and that's your first use case. It's the first domain and your first use case, and that, uh, according to the customers we have. That, that have implemented that is a standalone uh, value uh, you break even most likely within the first year just on that uh, investment uh, alone um, but once you've done that you can start using that same information uh, to populate as patient scheduling application um, and you can start looking at utilization maybe in a different applic application you probably have regulatory reporting around the cures act and other things you know in integrating some of this peer information with uh, uh, some of the provider information with some of your pairs so there might be another application there you might be doing referral management uh, you might be looking at uh, you know, based on utilization you might be looking at physician recruitment what coverage do we have in oncology versus pediatrics again that might lead to to another application and then even things uh, that would seem on a, their face fairly far afield like identity access and management so you know, it could be identity access uh, for uh, applications. It could even be for buildings and swipe cards and things like that. So this one domain here can have knock-on effects or, or um, beneficial effects in a whole range of different applications. So the very first one might take, um, let's hope it takes 60 days or maybe even less to deploy, but these others can be deployed in a matter of a few weeks. It's just a question of, of um, and by, by a few, I mean like, you know, one to three weeks. So you start to build a little bit of a, a rolling snowball, uh, if you like. Um, then uh, um, someone like MD Anderson, who happens to also be in, in the healthcare, uh, they started three to four years ago in their MDM journey. And they've built um, really what they think of internally as a uh, center of expertise around master data management. So uh, they started off, um, I wouldn't have predicted this, but this, this was what they, was important to them. They started off with modeling facility and location. Um, you know, the buildings that they have, the facilities within the buildings, whether they're healthcare facilities like MRI machines or whether they're uh, meeting rooms. And so they, they, they started to be able to um, properly organize event management even things like uh, call management, uh, they have uh, you know, managing the the, the um, points of contact for the particular facilities, and even fire monitoring. They they have uh, regulatory needs to uh, uh, have 
a way of interfacing with the, the local fire department so that this gave them you know the the facility the name the address the lat long how many stories high it is all that kind of stuff could they do that independently in all of these different applications absolutely they could that's what they were doing before but it's inefficient and uh, you know, once you've built a domain around facility you can populate all of these things easily um, they then started on employee uh, so they're modeling which is kind of a, a superset of provider because most of their providers are already employees but then they have uh, you know, janitorial staff, they have IT staff, they have all those kinds of other people. Uh, so they're they're dealing there with access management, publishing an employee directory, emergency notification call down trees for uh, uh, you know, emergency notification for you know public emergencies or anything like that. Again, could you do the, these things all independently? Absolutely, you could. Uh, but there's no one other place that manages um, the full list of employees that can populate this. Now. You, my immediate reaction when I heard about this, well, don't you have an HR system that does that? And, you know, you have payroll and whatever. And their answer was, yeah, that has some of the information, but it doesn't have all the information. And it can't because of, you know, limitations in the system. So we built a hub for it and we manage all of that. Uh, and I'll, I'll whip through the rest of these fairly quickly because hopefully you're getting the idea. But um, they, they also have patient, which you would imagine is one of their most uh, important domains. So they, where they have a patient, they have uh, you know information about the patient, their name and address, but also their age, uh, previous uh, um, uh, diagnoses that they've been involved with, uh, clinic contact only flags for someone who can be reached out to as part of a study, or someone who can only be reached out to as as a part of a, you know, a patient care, etc. Uh, MD Anderson, in case everyone's not aware of, it, I should have said this at the beginning. They're, they they specialize in cancer care. Um, they're part of the uh, University of Texas, and they're the largest single uh, cancer research facility in the world. So they do obviously uh, a lot of. They have a lot of patients, and they have. Uh, they, they look very carefully about studies that people have been part of uh, for clinical follow-ups. They also are uh, a nonprofit, so they manage their donors. Not something you'd expect a healthcare company necessarily to do, but they do it, and they've built. Uh, um, a link to their CRM system in order to to uh, manage that and do not contact suppression lists. Supplies is an area that they're just building up right now, which is about you know procurement items, um, so that they can benchmark their costs and try and uh, lower their costs. They're expecting a big return on investment from this one. And then uh, reference data management um, it touches on a lot of different things, including an area that they're really uh, um, building up now is. Um, uh, diagnosis information. They're, they're building up a whole library and glossary of um, uh, medical diagnoses. Uh, there are a lot of standard uh, diagnosis, diagnosis codes out there in the world, but these are guys are very specialized in cancer uh, oncology, and so they uh, they need to build out di directories and glossaries that are very specific to them. So the point of going through all of that long uh, a diatribe was they have built out six different domains and each domain has multiple use cases or multiple systems that it um, helps populate, uh, which would have been maybe possible, but would have been incredibly inefficient if they'd have done them independently. And they've found that over the years, now, now they have people coming to them. And when the whole COVID crisis uh, hit um, what, two, three months ago now, uh, they, they saw the need to uh, do some new studies around uh, the interactions between cancer and COVID and uh, you know, which groups might be more resistant, which groups might be more um, susceptible. And so they started immediately, the, the, when that came up, they realized they needed a bit more specific diagnosis information. They came to the MDM team and said, could you build out this ontology for us? Um, having built out the ontology, they've used it to upgrade their clinical systems and now they've, they're capturing better data around that uh, um, those, those study interactions, and they're able to not only use that for better research themselves, but they're also now sharing it with Johns Hopkins and other universities or, or, or uh, research centers around the world. So uh, these were the guys that uh, when they had a problem with their data, that they needed the data to be a little bit different, they came to the MDM team in order to get that done because they knew the MDM team had a track record of being able to uh, organize that kind of stuff really quickly. So. Um, let me take a, a, a pause there because uh, that probably felt a little bit like a fire hose. Bill uh, or uh, Christopher, anybody want to just comment quickly on that before I jump into a, a, another use case uh, for illustrative purposes? There's two things that I, I jump in and, and chime in on here. One of them is you know, if you're looking to build out your MDM program and you're looking at technical solutions, 
Now, there's two things that help enable this. One of them is a solution, you know, a modern solution that's um, easy to configure and low effort, right? And what's great about this story is um, MD Anderson went on and did these additional domains with almost zero support or help from our consulting team or third parties, right? The, the tool is easy enough that they're able to, to do this themselves. So it's, it becomes not just a way of life, but also self-service, um, which is important. And if you're thinking about going beyond the first use case, you don't want the complexity or effort to become a barrier to getting to that next use case. Um, so I think that's super important. Um, and then also when you're thinking about solutions, make sure you understand if there's license implications to your next use case, because right? that can become a barrier as well. Um, and as you do this, you know, the, the value of the solution and the technology goes up, but also, you know, th this is where data becomes a way of life. They've changed their entire perspective on how they think about data, how they think about data interactions across their, their ecosystem. Um, and it's probably by building this kind of, as you said, Martin, the snowball effect of, of adding more data and, and managing more data actively. Exactly. And, and I, I use the term, it becomes a center of expertise, but it also becomes a core competence, is what I think you just said there, Christopher. Um, the organization gets better because this is part of the foundation. What's interesting to me on this case study is they started off with facility and location. They had a very specific use case and problem they wanted to, to solve. And once it became a way of life, they 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 expanded their their center of excellence center of excellence to do more use cases. And there's a lot of innovation that happened. So what happened with some of the COVID codes and reference data was something they had not even thought about in the beginning. So they really grew into the solution and really innovated in a way that they could never have thought of in the beginning. Exactly. And in fact, um, I wasn't here at the time, but I was told that um, when they originally bought, they were looking at patient information. That was kind of the thing that was um, uh, they wanted to solve. But after they had gone through um, an analysis of where they could get a quick win, they said, you know, the facility location thing, it's just easier to bite off. Let's do that really fast. Let's get it out there and get some experience. And then we will build towards the patient. So uh, I think that also speaks to a lot of things that we've uh, discussed over the last couple of sessions that uh, pick the right starting point so you can get a quick win. Don't don't pick something that, you know, maybe patient is ultimately what we want, but it's it's a little bit of a, it's a bigger one. Uh, and you might want to just uh, um, get a little bit more experience under your belt before you uh, try and attack it for head on. So let me go to the next uh, uh, example, because I don't want to uh, just talk about uh, healthcare. This is from a recent manufacturing webcast we did. So if you're in manufacturing, um, the world tends to look like you've got what's inside the, 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 the organization, the, the operations, then you can look up the supply chain to where you're buying stuff, procuring things in order to uh, uh, put them into your manufacturing uh, um, operation. And then the demand chain is where you sell stuff. And uh, the, in the, the gray boxes are, are ovals, I should say, are just some, a, a smattering of the kinds of use cases you might think about. Um, and if you're thinking about, um, for example, the, the first thing you might want to pick off is uh, vendor communications. We, we, we want to have a vendor portal. We want to have people sign in and self-register, things like that. That might require building out the supplier domain. But, you know, that might be relatively simple. It's probably a tractable number. Uh, you're going to do some golden record, uh, building up of the golden record around suppliers and then uh, some of you know, what are the, the governance rules around our suppliers that might have independent value. But the next thing we want to do is strategic sourcing and procurement. Well, for that, you probably need to have both supplier and item or, or material information. So what are, who are we buying from and what are we buying? But you've already got half of that. You've already just built up the supplier part. Uh, so now you just need to build out the, uh, uh, the, the, the domain around item and now you can start doing uh, uh, strategic sourcing procurement so you, you build your way towards it through careful selection of which domain which use case am i going to handle and then i kind of build from there on the the demand side um you might uh, start saying i i want uh, to build an online catalog so i'm going to model my products and this is very common to go into a website or whatever um uh, so i'm going to model product but then i want to really optimize customer experience or I want to optimize, I want to use AI 
learning to look at the combination of who has been buying what in order to make very customized uh, uh, promotions. So now I model the, the customers, uh, I build a domain for customers, I build a domain for products, the combination of the two allows me to do the next best step promotion. So um, there's usually stepping stones where you can go from one to the next and where the, the next one is actually easier than the first um, and the, the, the value starts to kind of go up in a, in a hockey stick. So um, let me um, get uh, uh, um, other folks in here. Bill or Harbert, do you want to, uh, or any of you guys, have any examples? I'd like to say something where really you've interesting about real this. Yes, sir. What's really interesting about this slide for me is think about all the, the value opportunities that, you know, that can take place when you master and understand the data through your, your system. You can, you can change how you do inventory management. You can reduce your inventory days. You can uh, improve uh, um, your website sales through your online catalog when you're able to do substitutes and like products, which is critical for, uh, for a manufacturer. How you do predictive maintenance and you uh, eliminate or mitigate downtime or unnecessary downtime. These are all huge bottom line impacts in organization. And this is when we look, do a business impact roadmap, we take these concepts and we add a quantitative analysis behind it because when you look at it, uh, a manufacturing company that can do these things better can absolutely change its relationship with its suppliers, with its customers, and how it manages inventory. Right, exactly. I think there was um, there was uh, in a conversation in the last couple of days uh, we talked about. I think this was you, Harbor, an insurance company that we were working with, where um, there was business model innovation coming from uh, having thought through which uh, which domains they were tackling and, and in which order. Absolutely, a lot of uh, the the core systems that a uh, particularly a property and casualty insurance company will use are, are very specific to the policy. So you'll have John Doe who has an auto policy. You might have John Doe who has a homeowner's or renter's policy, but, uh, but the core system doesn't allow the, that association and that relationship. So when you're trying to do cross-selling, upselling in your marketing programs, we don't know who your, your customer is and what they have with you in, a, you know, in an easy, quick way. It's almost impossible to offer a very in a very fast way, you know, policy discounts and the proper pricing. We, to carry that to another level, you know, if you don't know, if you have people who have multiple policies with you and they're particularly or potentially a fraud risk, well, you need to know that fraud risk as it relates to your complete underwriting portfolio if you don't have that view and that perspective. So when you look at the data, like for the property and casualty company, it's just not revenue, but it's also controlling loss. So, a good MDM looks at the business outcome, and obviously we've talked about this uh, throughout all five, six sessions. One thing I, I would just add to that, uh, I don't think I've heard it stated today. Um, we've, we've, and it's natural to do it, we've concentrated on sort of financial outcomes, both above and below the line. But, you know, just looking at MD Anderson, you know, they've actually bled into sort of, no pun intended, the, you know, the, the idea of, um, clinical outcomes. And even, you know, we talked about risk a lot last week. Uh, there are other concepts you can use in quantifying this stuff around goodwill. So they, they probably started off with realizing financial and operational savings. I, they would probably tell you right now, they're saving lives as a result of this. And by improving clinical outcomes, minimizing hospital stays, lowering mortality. Uh, so there can be some real benefits. You see this in the public sector with MDM as well. Uh, so I would say to everybody out there, don't don't be afraid to depart from dollars and cents, uh, or euros or pounds or whatever you would normally think. And those are going to be the most uh, compelling things on a piece of paper. But there are others uh, to look at, and you can quantify them at the end of the day if you really put your mind to it. Yeah. And what yeah. Bill just said, he's exactly right. As a finance person, it's also sacrilegious for me. Um, <laughs> Sorry. The <laughs> I want the I want the return on investment, but Bill is absolutely right. Um, if you do your your use cases right, you're able to book your savings and your benefits and your opportunities, and it really allows you to innovate in areas where you have goodwill or you have something that might not be clearly quantified from a financial perspective. So as usual, Bill is exactly right on this. Think 
you know, just what it means to you in your business, not just finance, dollars and cents, but also everything else involved and your goodwill and what it means to you to succeed in the marketplace. Yep. I think there's also, uh, Bill, you mentioned this uh, um, in the last few days, I think that uh, th th there comes a point of critical mass where you've filled in enough of the foundation that uh, you go from, uh, uh, you kind of flip the polarity, I think is how you, you put it, uh, where you go from revolution, uh, sorry, evolution to revolution. Can you talk yeah, a little bit about and it, you know, it has to do with the styles and moving from MDM being downstream on the technical side. Uh, the technical symptom or, or manifestation of this is MDM begins to move upstream and become the system of record for some attributes, then more attributes, then more attributes. Uh, and that's what I always mean. I mean, when I always say reverse the polarity, it starts one way and it's the same physical infrastructure. You're just uh, getting things ready. You're not, ter you're not uh, invading in any way your operational landscape, but eventually you're going to want to do that. And from a data perspective, that's digital transformation. Uh, that's the point at which, you know, everybody says digital business and digital transformation. That's what it is. Uh, you, you can put all the, the great processes in place that you want uh, with a great danger of failing faster or more miserably. And I, I mentioned risk earlier, reputational risk. You know, if you just do something crazy, people start tweeting about it, uh, if not suing you. Um, or calling or calling CNN. So again, it, it becomes more and more important and that transformation carries risk uh, as well as benefit. And in order to minimize risk and maximize benefit, you have to tr be able to trust the data and have this foundation. Otherwise, uh, you're, you're just looking for trouble at the end of the day. Yep, exactly. Um, uh, we'll move to the next section and, and I'll remind everyone, we've been getting some questions coming in, which is fantastic. That's exactly what we want. Uh, we will try and uh, uh, sweep them up as we as we go along to the best of our ability or, or, or catch them at the end. But if anyone else has any questions as we go along, please drop them in the uh, questions box and we will do our best to uh, to cover them off. So um, the next kind of re related topic here is is how do you plan beyond the first use case? Um, what, how, what, how do you think about it? Um, we touched on these things just a little bit in the previous sessions, but uh, let's tackle it head on here with uh, uh, and, and have Harbert uh, uh, talk a little bit about how he used it with regards to the uh, the BIR um, uh, program. And, and by the way, there was a question earlier about uh, is the, um, the the business impact roadmap free? Yes, it is. Just to answer that question real quick. Good. You've, we've shown the slide a couple of times and we've talked to it, but we've always talked about it uh, in a way of how to get started to understand where the use case complexity, uh, where you're likely to get the biggest value for the effort, what we call no-brainers. Um, the idea is you want to start small, obviously think big, and that was part of the, you know, I think why MD Anderson succeeded. They they did the quick win and they built off that. But what's interesting is that if you really look at this 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 framework here, it's really about risk. It's about understanding risk and managing risk, and so. What's interesting is once you begin to implement an MDM solution and you begin to master more data and you begin to, to develop the skills, well, being able to do more complex use cases become way simpler. You don't have the same risk profile because once your data is mastered and you begin to link, say, product data to customer data, what would have been really risky in the beginning becomes somewhat of a no-brainer and way simpler. So your use case complexity uh, is reduced and your your value is the same. You'll see the the red the blue circles move from uh, the right to the left. So your strivers, what really had been kind of pie in the sky type, uh, you know, things you wanted to do become no brainers. It becomes simple. It's like you know, it's like training for a marathon. Once you're at that level, it's something you can do, and it's not the you know the same same effort because you're you're there and you're in shape. So when you when we look at this, we really try to build upon the program where we make it a way of life. And what's so good about this framework is it also, I think, helps with uh, pushing people to think outside the box and to innovate and really, you know, think about what brings value to the organization. And obviously, I like dollars and cents, but going back to what Bill was saying, there's so much more. There's brand uh, reputation. There's goodwill. There's everything. There's If you're in the healthcare sector, there's about how to, to take care of your patients, things like this. So... I think when you look at this and as you plan, think about what you can do now and building that skill set up so that your strivers become no-brainers. 
you had to kind of uh, chime in on what uh, Martin has said earlier about um, manufacturing use cases, right? Strategic sourcing is, is really um, high impact and high value, but it's complex because you're dealing with items or materials as well as suppliers um, and tackling multiple domains right out of the gate um, might be too complex or too risky, or um, the other thing is may take too long right, before you realize actual benefits. But back to his example, by starting with supplier onboarding or something focused, where you're just dealing with a single domain that's a relatively low volume, that's a no brainer, but it chips away at the complexity or the more um, high impact strategic sourcing initiative. So it's, it's kind of decomposing your strivers into no-brainer chunks um, is one way to think about this. And, you know, we get a lot of questions from people. It's like, hey, that, that makes sense, but how do I do that in my organization? Um, and that's where we keep coming back to this, this business impact. Right? How do you figure out what are the strivers and what are the no-brainers? What's the, the benefit and what's the complexity? Um, and really the best way to do that is something quantitative. People know that there's data issues, people know that there's potential improvement, but it's really hard to, to prioritize if you don't quantify. Exactly. And to go to the quantitative example, uh, if you do your quantification right, and you're really analytical, it also highlights what you cannot quantify. And it's okay not to quantify certain things, as long as you've done a good job of quantifying what can and should be quantified. Um, you know, but but then again, if you if, if you cannot necessarily quantify a, a business impact, you should be able to understand relevant relevant um, the level of effort that it might take to do that. So even though you might not be able to quantify everything, you can at least have some type of insight into the level of effort and what's needed to be done and what that what that impact might be from from low to high. Yeah. Interestingly, I I see um <clears throat> two different uh, methods of how the uh, um, the second, third, and fourth use cases kind of come about. Um, one is a very kind of deliberate planned way where it's each one is a stepping stone to the other. And uh, um, one of our recent customers in, in the healthcare space, not, not MD Anderson, um, is a good example of it. They justify their purchase based on um, needing to build a provider hub for some of the reasons that we, we talked about earlier, because uh, regulatory requirements and, and just general business efficiency. Um, but they as part of their acquisition planned, okay, as soon as we've got that done, we will start doing facilities because we want to do better on the facility management and it's something that's very inefficient for us. And we will start doing reference data management because we need reference data to be managed um, from many parts of the business. We want to provide a single place for it to be managed so that it is leveraged across the business, even if the, the business stakeholders are, are widely apart. So they bought on one use case, but they already had two more lined up in the wings that were natural for them, natural progressions. Um, then and other ones uh, seem to be just a bit more, uh, I don't wanna say it's accidental, but they, they kind of grow organically. Um, a good example might be Domino's, and, and Christopher, you can probably add to this, but the, the basic uh, uh, story is, uh, and I mentioned their name because they've spoken for us publicly before, they started off um, mastering customer information about the people who order pizzas, um, or over the phone or by the website or whatever, so that they can do marketing programs around them and, and build a lot of efficiency around that. Um, that became successful. And then they started um, deploying that same model around the world. But then other things that were completely unrelated came up that I don't know that anyone would have planned on. Uh, and now they're using um, uh, Prophecy uh, MDM to manage uh, IT assets, uh, you know, IT asset management and inventory management and you know, monitoring and replacements and things like that thoroughly, <laughs> completely unrelated, but they started to be viewed as a center of expertise and they started to be viewed as people who can solve, you know, disconnected problems. And so, you know, that's that's another way for these things to kind of uh, grow in themselves. On, on their journey, they're now up to their, their seventh edition, so eight total use cases that they're now leveraging this single MDM platform for. And what's interesting is that um, you know, we talked about using no-brainers as a way to, you know, decompose your strivers to make them no-brainers to get <laughs> to the strivers. The other thing that happens, and this is true with the, the other uh, medical customers you're talking about, Martin, and it's true in the case of Domino's, is that, you know, there's a, a whole collection of nice-to-have data management uh, use cases 
that didn't have a tremendous amount of benefit. So they, they didn't quite make it up to the no-brainer category as the place to start. However, once you start to develop this center of expertise, the um, effort required to deploy the next solution or the next domain goes down exponentially, which means that some of those nice to have start to bubble up to being no brainers because even though the business benefit is not as high, the F level of effort and the level of investment is substantially lower when you've gone beyond your first use case. So when I look at some of the things that Domino's has done, you mentioned they started with IT assets and, and managing all their IT assets. Then they've gone on and built on reference data, which is extremely common. Um, they went even down to things like managing their requests for print, um, print materials and collateral. They've gone to do uh, facility and locations, so all their store and site locations. They've related that now to their supply chain services so they can better uh, facilitate delivery to those locations. You know, so they kind of keep building upon each other. But some of those things would have fallen into the nice to have button. It would not have been the, uh, a use case that would justify launching a data management program on their own. However, now that they've got the platform and the expertise, some of those other use cases start to bubble up and become highly viable um, for the organization. So it's there's there's <laughs> multiple paths into the no-brainer quadrant. Exactly. Um, one other thing that uh, I think was touched upon uh, briefly in a previous discussion, Bill, was um, you mentioned rapid prototyping and agile development based on uh, having MDM in place, which not necessarily something that would be intuitive. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so there, there's, uh, I always call it an off-label use. Maybe I should stop saying that. But, you know, <laughs> one of the uh, uses of MDM, I think I mentioned it yesterday, the day before, is to ha have a home temporary or permanent for master data attributes that don't really have a home uh, in any particular business app. And, you know, the vendors that may have sold you those apps uh, don't want to add any any attributes uh, for your particular use case. And even if it's developed internally, uh, there's an expense to that. And some of these systems, nobody wants to touch. There are actually many legacy systems out there that no one understands uh, the internals of and, and don't really want to. Uh, so, you know, I always tell the story a few years ago, I was at one of the Gartner summits, the, the big data and analytics one, and I saw a guy from a big company. Uh, I won't mention the company's name, but everybody would know it. Uh, and uh, you know, he clearly had MDM as a way of life where he worked and, you know, he always was presenting on, on best practices and use cases and things. And finally, one day he attended a workshop and I said during the workshop phase, you know, wh why are you here? You know, you know this as well as anybody. Uh, and he pointed to, to a fellow across the room and he said, you see that guy? And I said, yes. He said, uh, I'm here following him because he's my competitor. I want to see what they're doing. Uh, and I just want to make sure that we stay ahead of everybody else. And so I said, I became intrigued that, you know, this guy really had best practices nailed down. I said, okay, you know, how would you describe MDM in terms of uh, beneficial end state or something like that? And he said a great thing. He said, I can take any idea that the business has. Uh, and once, once they put it through, let's say governance, whatever their governance process is, and someone decides it's worthwhile. Uh, and in effect, they're doing their own internal business impact roadmap in an agile way. And we'll get to that before the end today, I hope, around what that means on the business side. But basically what they're saying is, I can take any business idea and fully attribute it and get it in production in 15 business days. So three calendar weeks, uh, it's got a UI, it's got somebody maintaining it, it's got all, all the integrations we know about that are needed are in place. And that's because I can, you know, anybody who's put code into production or data into production is, is doing the backwards uh, moonwalk in their mind now saying, well, if he did it in production in 15 days, he had it in, in unit tests within four or five at worst, uh, and that's correct. So what he's saying is, you know, we now have this process where a part of our way of life is if somebody has an idea, they voice it, uh, it gets vetted, and it gets physicalized uh, pretty quickly. And you could never do that with your core operational systems, right? Right. If you're running you know, your core ERP, whatever flavor that may be, you know, most of those tools, even some of the older ones, they're extensible, right? You can add attributes and you can sometimes even add first class objects or entities. So they're extensible. The problem is it's your core ERP and just the, the regression testing that you would need to do alone so that you don't somehow disrupt business operations can be months um, of effort. And so, you know, those, those tools, because they're highly specialized and so critical just to, the, to keeping the lights on, it's a really bad place to go tinkering around. 
But when you have this standalone data management platform, you know, prototyping and modeling and, and instantiating new attributes, new entities, new objects, um, in, you've got this uh, abstraction from your core operations that allows for that agility. And the cust and I'll give the, the the other sort of obvious example, and this goes back to my first MDM implementation 20 years ago, uh, where someone walked up to me from the business and said, I, "I'm looking at all this, and it looks pretty flexible. Could you start to capture familial relationships? You know, we do it now with householding in a data warehouse, but it's just really inaccurate. It doesn't really hurt us, or we don't know if it hurts us. Uh, but I'd really like to get that information sort of 100% accurate." Uh, mm -hmm. Is there any way that you, this could be, we could ask somebody during a customer serv service call or email chain, if it's okay, you know, we've detected these relationships. Is it okay if we uh, verify and, and, and code them in? Uh, you might get a family discount later on. I can't give you anything now. Worst case, can't give you anything now, but you know, something may come down the road. Uh, would you mind? Some people are gonna say no, but the vast majority, uh, if you say discount, uh, even in a speculative mode, they say yes, so. Uh, again, that's an early kind of simple example of there are no, none of these business apps, to Christopher's point, none of the ERPs wanted to, to store the fact that my father and I were related across contracts. You know, and so anything almost at the party level, as opposed to the contractor product level, uh, is fair game for that. Absolutely. Excellent. All right. So the, the final uh, uh, topic here, and I'm seeing some questions uh, online that we will get to them shortly. But again, uh, drop any more in if you, if you have them. So we've kind of been looking at this um you know you're at the start of the journey and you're trying to look at beyond the first step which is i think very helpful to, to start with the end in mind and set expectations and all that kind of stuff when you are farther down the journey and you've, you've built a little bit of maturity around what you're doing um you have hopefully become viewed as a, a center of expertise and i would say that uh, most of our long-standing customers where uh, you know we have an ongoing relationship that, and we speak to them, they come to our customer advisory board every year, that kind of thing. Um, they are people, they are organizations who have implemented several use cases. That's what gives this whole thing longevity and, and, and real value. But let's talk a little bit about what it looks like when you're there. Um, you know, what, what the world looks like, uh, what's your, you know, daily life, how, how you operate within the organization, how do, what, what are the, um, how does it change? A little bit. Um, who wants to, to to lead off on this one? Bill, I know you've talked a little bit about uh, um, cross-functional use cases, and you touched on it just a minute. Yeah. Let's so, a bit you know, sure. Uh, there's a couple of things around that, you know, and uh, I'll start with sort of the mechanical side because one of the questions I used to get was sort of a different version of this, but it turns out I believe it's it's the same thing. Is you know, even as an analyst, and I've gotten into prophecy a little bit, uh, I get this question of, you know, everybody talks about seeing across silos, uh, both process silos and data silos, and bringing them together and transforming the business. You know, who does that? You know, everybody in my organization is in the silo. They, they can't look up and all of a sudden see what everybody else is doing or what the synergies might be or the gaps. Uh, if you go below the line, you know, what are the issues here? Uh, I know I have to grab a, a spreadsheet from somebody and re-enter the data. Uh, but by itself, that, that doesn't seem, you know, that's not a million dollar problem or a half million dollar problem. I could do that until I retire and it'd be okay. And I really don't want to, you know, I, I need more than that to kind of get off the dime. And yes, what we're talking about these last couple of weeks is about that. But there are organizational, we used the word inertia last week. Uh, and so what does that mean to get to conquer that or, or, or at least start to kind of get control of it? Uh, and the answer on the ground, for example, is, you know, in my book, and I'm only one opinion, I believe that that's the job of the governance organization that you're going to create. So along with all these use cases, and this is as good a place to any to, as any to talk about this, MDM as a way of life is going to include a business resident uh, data governance organization, and that should grow as these use cases are adopted, uh, and you need stewards and, and council members, if you will, uh, to manage that. But another part of that that's not so obvious is uh, I believe that that organization should have the budget to pay out, for example, if I've got six lines of business or six regions and none of them, no one of them sees enough benefit, even if it really existed, they don't see it enough to say, you know what, I'm going to pay for everybody. Uh, take it out of my budget. I'll put the request in for next year. Uh, I can't tell, I can count on one hand the number of times I've uh, in my life come up against 
uh, people who are so nice and magnanimous that they said something like that. Everybody, <laughs> the common answer is, yeah, that, that looks really cool, but uh, you know, I, I got all I could do to maintain my staff of five programmers. Uh, I'm not gonna do that. Uh, and so the answer is to have somebody that does have the money that they can transfer out on a time and materials basis. I, I, I tell the story of, you know, 20 years ago, I learned this and wrote a paper on it for Gartner, where um, post 9-11, the program I was on was the only real IT infrastructure program outside of maintenance uh, for about a year because everybody just tightened up. Um, so not so different than now, actually. But, you know, MDM was left because it was viewed as strategically beneficial. And um, we still had people that said, you know, all I have is five people doing maintenance. I'm going to have production problems. I can't have people uh, doing this sort of pie in the sky thing. And remember, there was no really no such thing as MDM then. Uh, our CEO was a former CIO, and he actually I related this problem to him. And he said, OK, I'm going to give you the money. And I'm going to zero base budget everybody else except for maintenance. So if they don't want to do it, you're, you know, I'm going to start asking for names of people to lay off. Uh, and you'd be surprised how quickly that turned around. Uh, or all of a sudden, everybody wanted the the how to. We had a little how to manual to integrate with MDM, or what we called uh, customer information file at the time. Uh, and people all of a sudden got really interested uh, because we had the money to give them. Okay, well, I'll go get a consultant. If you're going to give me a hundred thousand dollars, I'll bring a consultant in here for six months, and uh, and we'll get it done. By by gosh, we'll get it done. Uh, you know, why didn't you why didn't you say it that way when you first came in here? Uh, kind of thing. Uh, so. Uh, again, this idea of having, you know, to answer the original question I posited, which is how do I physically get this cross enterprise view that's going to show me all these things? Well, our BIR process is one way, uh, and that's from outside, and that's a good way to do it. I said I'm a believer in consulting for the same reason, uh, but uh, the end result, more often than not, has to be somebody that's got money on an ongoing basis, to be blunt. Yeah, and yeah. can see can see or can force somebody else to see uh you know to to see across all these quote unquote silos uh that's why the other question i used to get is do i really need c level people on that council yes you do and that's why because if it was easy for everybody to see these things they would have just to get the credit for solving them <laughs> uh so that means there's too much work involved for me to bother trying to get the credit and and if you're going to solve it you need a new structure yep that kind um, of goes back to the um, two by two a little bit, right? When you're also thinking about exactly. what are the use cases that are no-brainers versus strivers. If your use case is going to require buy-in and funding from six different business functions or business units, you know, you could spend six months just, you know, herding cats to, to get the buy-in before you ever even get started. And so I'd leave that way out to the far right of the strivers quadrant. Um, but if you decompose that and say, hey, I can break this down into smaller use cases. One of the other considerations is, hey, if I can make, get a use case that does have value, that's a no brainer, but it only impacts a single department or function, you know, it's much easier to secure that buy-in. So the same approach of like decomposing and chipping away at strivers in terms of complexity, um, you can also do that, take that same approach when you've got, you know, high value use cases down the road, require this buy-in you start chipping away departmentally so there's there's multiple ways to kind of decompose those more complex but high value use cases exactly and once um, and once you have quick wins and you have success it's easier to get funding and it's easier to get um, support from the organization because you have credibility and that's another reason why we say look at quick wins first exactly one thing that bill mentioned there that i wanted to follow up on christopher is um uh, the idea of governance. So there's a, there's a pretty big overlap between the MDM program and the governance program. Um, our uh, experience tells us that there's often the same people or the same people are involved. But um, can you talk a little bit about gov the relationship between governance and MDM, just to, for, for anyone who um, you know needs to hear some discussion on it? Sure. Yeah, I'll gladly jump on that. And, and we see this often. Um, it's interesting. Um, you know, governance and Master data management absolutely go hand in hand. Right? You kind of you, you kind of can't do one without the other. The governance is actually deciding, right, and and making decisions about how should data be managed, where should data originate, what should be the system of record, entity by entity and attribute by attribute. Right? That's the process of governance, and it's, it's pretty process oriented and often involves documentation. 
to me, the MDM platform is the, how do I bring that to life? How do I actually operationalize this governance model that we've designed or, or defined for the organization? Um, one of the traps that I see, you know, don't fall into this, is that, um, yes, you should have a, a clear vision of what uh, the governance of the data is going to be before you launch on your MDM program. But also, remember, we've gone on and on and on about starting small and having a specific no-brainer use case. You don't have to put together this cross-enterprise huge governance committee and decide how to manage all of your data before you begin. In fact, that's just analysis paralysis guaranteed. Right? You, just, you don't want to do that. Um, first of all, as we've said before, not all the data has the same value. You've got to get back to the use case that has a business outcome and then figure out the governance just in support of that use case. And then you use a technology like MDM to operationalize that. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, good. Thank you. Um, question. Um, I think this would be for you, Harbert. Uh, recommendations regarding first domain specific to our organizations and people. I, I would point out, I would say that uh, uh, for the person that asked that question, there's probably quite a bit of conversation about that in uh, yesterday's, no, the day before Monday's, Tuesday's, uh, I can say, uh, session, uh, picking the first use case. But Harbert, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, how to pick the first uh, domain specific to organizations and people? Um, <clears throat> yes. Um, this is a tricky question because the domain you go to first is going to differ by company and industry. Um, I like to say you want to go where you have the, the biggest problem or the biggest opportunity to enable something uh, that you can't do today. And going back to our framework of the benefit versus the uh, use case complexity, um, you then want to narrow down based upon what we were talking about earlier, certainty and risk, what's likely to give you the, the quick win. Um, eventually, you want to follow where the money is, I think, or where the, the real value is for the, for the organization. Um, and what we normally see from the greatest kind of value realization areas it's when you're able to link domains together from a cross-domain perspective. And there's another, that's another reason to, to, to kind of start smaller, master the domain, then, and in your um, future use cases, you know, find a way to link that data in a way that helps you innovate on your, your business model and your, and your processes. So there's not a cookie cutter answer that you always go XYZ domain first. You really need to understand your problem definition or the opportunity. And obviously the use case complexity versus the likely value. Um, and going back to the possibilities of true innovation when you bring all the domains together is really, really interesting. And we've just seen transformative power in that for, for organizations. Excellent. And you also, you also still have to integrate with the non-master data that's involved as well. Most of these use cases are gonna involve data beyond master data. Like like transactions or interactions. A couple of questions. I want to give an example to that real quick. You know, we we were working with a financial services company, and they needed to bring in third party data to do their attribution, and they can't do that in house. They can't do it manually, uh, and it matters for their default rate and for their average revenue growth. So this is where they're pretty good with the with a certain customer domain, but what they can't do is they can't bring in other data and quickly relate the relationship with the hierarchies to their to that domain. And so when you bring in that other data, which is not master data, uh, it is a uh, more reference data, then it absolutely changes how they're able to, to market their financial services products. Great. A um, couple of questions. We're, we're nearly the top of the hour, so a couple of questions I want to sweep up because um, they didn't come up, uh, you know, as part of the conversation. Uh, there's questions about uh, verticals. Um, what do we have to support uh, industry verticals and in particular healthcare? We do have uh, pre-built models for several verticals. Um, I wouldn't call them necessarily complete applications, but they are templates that uh, allow someone to uh, get a quicker start. And we have about um, six of those, healthcare being one, in fact, being probably the most prominent one uh, at this point. Um, and then, uh, uh, Christopher, I'm going to throw this to you. 
uh, relationship management, hierarchies, groupings, and lineage. I know that's uh, <laughs> that's been part of your life for a long, long time. So do you want to talk about that for a moment? Yeah, I absolutely will. That, that uh, startup that I was one of the founders of, that was, that's where we got started, was mastering hierarchies, actually, hierarchies and relationships. Um, and what's interesting is that you will find that um, in many use cases, the need to manage relationships, that could be many to many or it could be hierarchies, is very prominent. And then the other thing that you will find is that a lot of common ERP platforms are quite rigid in the hierarchies and relationships that they support. Many times they allow only um, flat hierarchies, meaning that it's a fixed number of levels and finished good is always level number six. Um, and sometimes they don't support alternate hierarchies, you know, the ability to roll up and, and group things different ways. So we've got a, uh, for example, a wine and spirits manufacturer um, where they're settled with exactly that problem. They've got one of the most common ERP systems you can imagine in, uh, in manufacturing, and there's some limitations on the hierarchy management around products. So what they've done with Prophecy is they've modeled out multiple different product hierarchies to go after regions because something that might be considered a premium spirit in the North American market might be considered just a, uh, a well-grade <laughs> uh, spirit in the Asian market and vice versa. So you know, just to be able to properly market and promote, they needed to have the ability to manage myriads of different hierarchies around the same data. So those kinds of use cases are extremely common. And it kind of goes back to what Bill was saying about rapid prototyping, right? When you have a, a rich data management platform that supports those kinds of complex relationships, it's far easier to deploy and manage those in this abstract data management tool than to try to reconfigure your ERP or some other operational system. So that's an extremely common use case in this space that I've seen year after year. Excellent, thanks. Um, and then one final question, uh, which will take us to the top of the hour, I think. Um, and, and I think it will close off all of the questions that we've that have been asked online. Um, is uh, what if I'm, uh, the, the multiple use case idea is great, but what if my MDM tool does not support that? Uh, Christopher, you, you may have, uh, again, some experience. You want to talk about that? I'll, I'll try to keep this brief because we're at the top of the hour. But you know, one of the things I see over and over is that, um, look, data management is not brand new. But what's happened is it's evolved. Right? There's, there's solutions out there on the market, and we consider us one of them, where we're really like second generation and we're nimble. But organizations that have had data management issues have found ways to deal with it. Sometimes it's by throwing bodies and process to it. In many cases, a lot of organizations, especially larger organizations, organizations that do a lot of um, acquisitions, they may have built out a homegrown solution, or they may have been one of the early adopters, or one of the, the kind of early technologies that are pretty heavy and challenging to deploy and costly to manage and costly to go on to the next use case. And my recommendation is don't be trapped by your technology. Right? Don't, don't let yourself be trapped by the homegrown solution that people have sunk millions of dollars into, right? That's sunk cost. What you need to look at is what, how can I enable business innovation and new processes? What's the value of that? And then with modern tooling and technology, the, the barrier to entry is dramatically lower than trying to go configure a legacy tool or reconfigure a legacy tool or rebuild or modify a, a homegrown solution. So don't be trapped by, by legacy solutions within your organization. Thank you. Perfectly to the top of the hour. So we're, we're, we'll draw a line under it here. This is uh, the end of our six series, uh, the six, end of our six series uh, uh, sessions. Um, I want to thank uh, the panelists, uh, Christopher, Bill and Harbert. Thank you so much for being here uh, every day. I, I must confess when we started this uh, and we kind of lined out what we thought we might want to talk about, I thought there'd be about a half an hour of material for each day, but uh, I think a testament to the questions that have come in and a testament to the, the amount of experience on the panel here that uh, each one of these has gone all the way to the full hour. And also a testament to how much there is to say about master data management. There are so many uh, ways of, of pursuing it, uh, both right and wrong, that uh, there's just a lot to talk about here. So um, we're, uh, we'll draw a line under it here. Thank you very much again to the panelists. Thank you very much to the audience, particularly those of you who've been here for every session. It does seem like there's uh, a good few of you. Thank you for your perseverance. And uh, I'll say one more time that uh, if there's anything out of this session or any of the previous sessions that you want to follow up on, um, whether it's a, a discussion or a template that we used or, or, or whatever it is, 
uh, feel free to reach out to us. Um, if you're on an MDM journey, we're, we're just happy to talk. So with that, thank you so much and uh, look forward to speaking to you all at some point in the future. Thanks everyone. Yep, thank thanks, you. Everybody. Thank you.